so that things can get built so businesses can get run so that families can live in a decent place so that schools can have operating budgets and you know that has been our thesis has been that water in a desert is akin to money in a very poor place that if the money shows up good things will happen just the way when the water shows up green things will grow and that's been our goal in that bank from the beginning and you know we it's always a question of setting it up right and attracting really good people and so we've tried really hard to do that so i couldn't help but notice that that um four years out you actually acquired another bank um the the shore bank um, remnants of south shore one of the first socially minded banks to to uh, really sort of chart this this territory um in, in, in is acquisition part of the strategy of the bank to, I mean, do you want to grow the bank to be really big? Um, and what, what is your thought there? And um, do you like the idea of acquisition um, or um, uh, internal growth uh, more? Well, one of the people who we talked to about this bank before we started it is the gentleman I mentioned before from North Carolina, Martin Eakes. And basically he said, if you're going to do in California what we've done in North Carolina through the Self-Help Credit Union, you need a billion dollars worth of equity. So we, don't have, we have not put a billion dollars worth of equity into this bank. But we want to go from Canada to Mexico on the West Coast. And in order to do that, we're going to have to take some bigger steps, which probably does mean acquiring more assets. When you acquire a bank, I mean, if you sit there and think about what are you acquiring, what you're really acquiring is two things. You're acquiring their existing assets and liabilities, and you're acquiring the people. And it's fairly straightforward to do a financial analysis about what the, the loans are worth and what the liabilities are going to cost you. But in putting together an institution and trying to have it be healthy and have it, ha having it do the right things, you have to have people who are going to agree with your values and be organized in a similar way. So that when you think about acquisition of, a, a, of another bank, what you, you need to think about more than anything else is how is it actually going to fit into the framework we have? How is it going to be consistent with what we're trying to do? How is it going to take basically our mission and extend it along the Pacific Coast? So. You know, from our point of view, this is a way for us to get to the kind of size that Martinique's was saying is necessary faster, but it's something that we have to be really careful about how we do it. And in fact, if you look at the, you know, one of the things that I'm not that positive about is the incredible concentration of banking in the United States. I think the top six banks represent 80% of the banking assets in the United States. And they did it basically through acquisition. They bought a whole bunch of banks all over the country and just jammed them together. And the reason it was so profitable to do that and the reason it made so much sense for them is that they would buy it and then they'd fire everybody. So that all, all of a sudden they had all the interest income coming in, all the revenue, but you know, a fraction of the expenses so it looked like they were making a ton of money. That isn't actually the model that we're looking to uh, pursue going forward. I, um, I wonder if I can ask you about uh, an area of banking which is um, uh, s somewhat in disrepute, payday lending, and, and its effects on the kinds of communities that you're concerned about. Um, uh, it's an area that you know, has a very robust lobby that protects its interests. Uh, it's not an area that traditional banks have gotten into. Um, but in the kinds of communities where one Pacific Coast is engaged, it's obviously a big need. People don't have checking accounts, they can't get loans. Payday lenders charge exorbitant interest rates, et cetera. Have, ha, has the bank um, thought about um, looking at consumer lending in that area, as well as in residential and business uh, uh, real estate lending? With that teaching, do you know the answer to that question? Okay, yes, we are looking at this really hard. Um, in fact, Payday lending is a pretty straightforward idea, which is that a lot of people in our society either don't have access to credit 
or are very uncomfortable walking into a bank. So there are, I believe, more payday lenders in the state of California than McDonald's. There are a lot of payday lenders. And when you look at the numbers that they charge, they charge an enormous interest rate. And it's the kind of thing where they, what they try and do is get you in and never let you out. It's like the best customer for American Express is somebody who always has their maximum line drawn. So they're always paying interest at a very high rate and they never really pay it down. That's a great customer. Well, that's what payday lenders try and do. They try and get you in and never let you out. So they're always, you're always rolling your debt and getting a little bigger and paying a ton of interest so that you'll pay multiples of the amount that you've borrowed over time because the rates are so high and you can never really get ahead of it. So what we've tried to do is we are working really hard to come up with an alternative to payday lending where basically we're lending up to a thousand bucks a person, doing it through employers and charging a fraction so that we can you know, maybe make a little bit of money as a bank but charge a fraction of what payday lenders are doing. And really what payday lenders do is they have a storefront where no one's embarrassed to walk in. The only embarrassing thing is how much you're actually paying in interest, which you probably don't even want to admit to, admit to yourself. That's fascinating. I'm really surprised because that's not an area that social finance has touched very much that I know of, and I think you could really... Well, you, you know, it's funny because, honestly, it's going to sound like I idolize Mark Meeks, and I actually do, which is the most embarrassing thing, but um, he was telling me, he's a guy from a small town in North Carolina, and he was working in the civil rights movement in uh, the 60s, and one of the people came into his, he, but he, he, this is a really smart guy from a really small town. So some, some guy came into his office and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Eeks, can you help me because I've got a mortgage on my house and they won't let me pay it off. And I, I keep trying to pay it off and they won't let me. And uh, he, so Martin, who actually went to Yale Law School, says, I'm sure that's not true. That can't be true. But I will call up the vice president of the bank and straighten it out and find out what the facts are. So Martin calls the guy up, and he's, Martin has a real temper. I mean, he has a real temper. And he said, by the end of the conversation, he's talking to this guy, and everything that the gentleman came and said to him was true, was true. They wouldn't let him pay it off. They kept rolling his loan. He paid, you know, two or three times in total dollars the amount of his mortgage on his house. And this is like a 60-year-old guy. He, by the end of it, Martin said he's yelling at the vice president, I will take you down. If it's the last thing I ever do, I will take you and your bank down. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, oh, Martin is the man. He did. <laughs> um, so I want to shift to ownership of the bank. You, you chose to um, create a, a bank that lives in the regulated system. Um, how do you ensure its commitment to mission, and how have you structured the ownership in a way that, that will support that, or will somebody just buy it up someday and turn it to their um, own purposes? Well, let me say those are two slightly separate questions, ownership and mission, so let me address them separately, because they're intertwined, but they're not exactly the same thing. I mean, in terms of ownership, one of the reasons we wanted to have a bank was it's measurable. I, I think both my wife and I really feel strongly that it's important that you have the discipline of really doing what you're saying you're doing and not just talking a good game. So we really wanted to have, you know, we're lending money and we wanted to come back with interest so we can lend more money. But we also really didn't want anyone to say that we were going into the poorest communities and trying to scalp them and walk out better off. So what we did was we took the equity and put it into a foundation so that we'd irrevocably given away the money that was the, the equity source of the bank. So that if we made a scat of money and it was really profitable, that it would just go back into the bank or into the foundation that owned it, which would go into the community. So that any profits we made by law would not be ours would definitely go to benefit the community, either by making more loans, by being a bigger bank and having more money available, or by actually spending it usually on financial literacy in the community. And let me say this, having said that, that doesn't 
just because the ownership is set up in a way so that you don't have a, a selfish motive to succeed, we would like to succeed and the people who work in the bank would like to succeed and we never really, you can never really give up on keeping the mission in front of your face because the fact that we don't get to keep the money, people still care a lot about being successful and being profitable and you need to make sure that, you know, in an in a institution that's got, as my wife likes to say, a triple bottom line, we want to make money. We want to make sure we benefit the community and we want to make sure that from an environmental standpoint we're positive. You've got to make sure that it is a triple bottom line and you don't just look at the money. And, and the ownership structure will support that. Yeah. You and Kat were also involved in, I, I believe, in starting One Roof, which is another social enterprise that some of the people in the room no. Could you comment about that experience and how it contrasts with one California or one uh, Pacific Coast? Well, it was really exactly, and the former head of it is sitting right there, so it was exactly the same instinct, which was we thought that there was a way to provide a service to people who are underserved, in this case, outside the United States in really poor communities. In fact, there are two people who used to run it here. Um, all over the world and basically give them access to the information revolution. And that in so doing, you would take people in rural India, in different parts of Mexico, and basically, you know, in a funny way, bring them into the 21st century and give them access to information and knowledge and learning in a way that otherwise wouldn't be available. I'd say two things. One. That revolution is happening. We were absolutely right. It's incredibly powerful. I don't think there was any way really that that could be a self-sustaining business, which we actually thought that it could be, even charging you know a tiny amount of money. We felt like if you want to be on the web, even if you're super poor, you, should, you, you can prove that by paying something, and it could be incredibly cheap but we really wanted to enable that, but also make sure that we weren't fooling ourselves, which happens a lot where people opened cyber cafes, governments have cyber cafes that no one goes into because the machinery is no good and it's not up to date. So really what I would say, in some way, we ended up giving away the software that basically we developed some incredibly terrific software for running cyber cafes but we could never get paid for it, so we ended up ultimately saying we will provide this to people free so that we can actually enable the revolution that we wanted to have happen. I'd say there were two things that surprised me. One is the information revolution in the poorest parts of the world is going to go through people's cell phones, and I, I didn't get that. I thought that it was gonna go through more expensive equipment and that you would need to have a cyber cafe because no one could afford that equipment. So that it made a ton of sense to have that set up and that if we could do it and, and make it happen and be smart about it, that we would enable everybody basically hooking in. Well, I can tell you that everyone's hooking in with $6 phones and that that is the instrument which is, I mean, I, we went to the, our family, I happen to be in love soccer, and we went to South Africa to see the World Cup, but we also tried to, you know, go to different parts of the country and see how people lived and check it out. And one of the things that was absolutely ubiquitous was people had cell phones in places where, you know, really, really poor parts of the country, really poor um, villages, people were hooked in, and it wasn't through Macs or PCs. And so they're now, they're now becoming the, the, the vehicle of finance um, and, and banking. It's, it's fascinating in Pesa and Kenya and some other systems over there. I, I, I want to step back for, or ask you to step back, and, and I know we're going to run out of time for too long, but this question, you've you know, talked a lot about your, your success in the traditional financial markets. Obviously, Fairland is enormously successful there. You've talked about the deep motivations that underlay your interest in getting One Pacific Coast started and the strategies and even taking on payday lending and things like that, which are quite revolutionary. 
how do you see, how do you reconcile those two, two sort of streams of thinking? Um, and do you see them coming together? I mean, where, where, where does social finance live in the traditional capital markets that you work in? Um, do you see any convergence, any interest to clients that you engage with or uh, want to engage with? Um, uh, talk about mission, talk about um, the, the nature of the work. Um, how, how does this, how do you hold both of these worlds? <laughs> you know, it's funny because Drummond is asking some questions that are really on my mind. Um, let me say this. When you invest money for, we mostly invest for schools and foundations, you have to do what you tell them you're going to do so that you can't take their money and suddenly decide that, you know, the most important thing to happen is, uh, you know, to build a dam in uh, Zimbabwe. And if that, if that isn't what they're expecting you to do, if that isn't the basis on which they're expecting you to make decisions, you can't do it. Having said that, I actually think that there is, a, that there is going to be a new way of thinking about investing. And it's one that I'm thinking about a lot, and I can't say that I've got it completely clear in my mind. But I think we're gonna move to a different model of economic activity. And I think that what we're gonna, I think that that model is gonna try to include all of the results of the activity. So that, you know, the idea not to be too economic jargony, but to be a little bit economic jargony. I mean, the whole idea is gonna to be to include all of the externalities from your behavior. So that, you know, the simplest example is if you're gonna pollute a lot, you're gonna to have to pay to clean up your own pollution. So that in, a, in effect, I think we're gonna to move to a model which is more complete, that's gonna include all of the ramifications and where the concept of sustainability and um, continuity and not of depletion is going to be the model that people have in their heads over time. And I think that's going to be forced on us. I, I really do just by the way the natural world is moving and the way that the economies of the world are developing. So in thinking about it, I think that these two things are actually going to, um, are going to merge. It's probably going to take longer than I expect. But I think the thing that will make it happen faster is if people think this way and it turns out to be, not, I hate to say this, but really profitable. Because if it turns out that thinking this way is profitable or is more successful, then I believe that it will happen very fast. So the idea that to engage in social enterprise means you have to sacrifice return is not one you necessarily embrace. Well, I, actually, I'm drawing a little bit of a distinction between what has generally been thought of as social investing and what I'm thinking about is investing with a concept of sustainability. So let me talk about it. I mean, why is there a hole? Why is there a need for so-called social investing? The reason is because there are only two possible reasons. Either the returns aren't good enough to justify the risk, or people don't really understand the actual investment that you're making. So that if you think about Muhammad Yunus in the Grameen Bank, I think that people have come to the conclusion that before he um, pioneered that kind of lending, that people really didn't understand it. But I think if you think about what we're doing in Oakland or what we're trying to do in One Pacific Coast Bank, it, I think the expectation is that the returns on a purely monitor, uh, monetary basis will be lower than most banks want. Whereas from our point of view, so this is social investing, we, that's not what we see the returns as. You know, honestly, if we lend money to somebody who goes around and fixes up a whole bunch of apartment buildings in Oakland, and that makes that a safer community, lets families feel as if they're better off on the street and allows jobs to be created there, that's a return that to us is incredibly valuable but might not show up in, on the income statement. So that would be how I would think of social investing, where the returns, you know, if, 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 if you're not just looking at the bottom line to see the returns, you're trying to step back and look at the world and seeing how are the overall returns. When I think about sustainable investing, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, 
of what I'm thinking about. You know, someone once came and proposed to me to uh, build a mine in Romania. And it was like, they said, okay, let me just say this. It's really terrible what we're going to do, but it's very far away, and I'm not sure anyone will ever find out. <laughs> well, from a sustainable standpoint, that's not the best argument I've ever heard in my whole life. From a sustainable standpoint, you'd have to think, how are you going to you know, return that place at a minimum to what it was before, if that's in fact possible? And if you look at it that way, is there really a return to this money? I think that's where we're going. I hope that's where we're going. So that there's nobody sitting there saying, look, basically I can produce a very good monetary return for myself and the cleanup is going to be shared by everybody in this room, so it's a great deal. It's just the way it works now. Yeah, I mean, in many ways. Are you seeing much market interest in bringing these kinds of, this kind of thinking to bear in the, in the traditional markets? Well, I haven't gone out to market this. <laughs> I do believe that there is a form of this that is going, I honestly think this is going to be the dominant form of investing at some point.